Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Player Zone podcast channel. And after another week away from the Premier League football, I'm saying it once again, we're back here for Premier League predictions. Match week 13 now. Basically uh, a third of the way through the season. Very exciting times. Some massive storylines to come this weekend. We've got games that impact the top four. Games a team looking to bounce back after point reductions. We've got mid-table classics. It's the Premier League back to its best. And after a week away, we just miss it so much. You want to have it back. And absolutely stoked to be back here for predictions video. Let's talk about the point system. Obviously ended um, last week. Um, the previous week, sorry, on 76 prediction points. Um, our prediction points work. Three points for correct scoreline. One point for the correct result. And obviously zero if you get neither. So it came into the last game week with 76 points and left with 81. So five correct results predicted. Not a great week, but we'll take it. We'll take it in this uh, time after backing onto our three points for the week prior. So hopefully this is the week that we finally get things right and get a few more prediction points going our way. Um, before we jump into the video, guys, if you wouldn't mind liking it, subscribing the channel, sharing the channel with mates. Premier League action is back this weekend. So let's get around it. With that being said, guys, let's jump straight into the predictions. Our first game from the weekend is up in Manchester. Top of the table clash, Man City versus Liverpool. Arguably the game of the weekend, the Saturday midday kickoff. A lot to be excited about in this game. You know, back to the classic Klopp versus Pep rivalry. We've seen all the memes on social media, but it's time for them to go back at it again and clash heads. Um, it's going to be a really exciting game. Obviously, Liverpool coming off a string of great results, including the last time out, 3-0 win over Brentford. They seem to be unbeatable at home right now. I just... I can't see a way that people win at Anfield, but going away to the Eddie had a different sort of story. This year, chance creation, chance creation, chance creation. I've been big in that all season. Um, I've seen improvements in the whole of the pitch. Obviously, we you know Allison's probably the best keeper in the world. You've got Trent Alexander-Arnold, who in this new system, um, in possession as a right-sided centre-back, ducking into midfield has been very you know, in influential, massive impact on their aggression going forward, on their attacking play um, from that inverted role. He's been huge. Um, interesting how Andy Robson comes back in this system as well for the future. But the defence has been so much more solid, led by Virgil van Dijk, the captain. Has had massive games now in recent weeks. He's been big for them. And also midfield. So Bosley's had a quieter last few weeks, but we know what he does. McAllister is one of their best midfielders, probably one of the better pickups this season. No one's really talked about in terms of linking the game up for Liverpool and progressing the ball for them. And whether it's Gravenberch, Endo, Gakpo, whoever plays in that midfield three, there's going to be a chance created. And as such, we're seeing Salah with incredible numbers. Darwin Nunes is in everything. He, no matter what the game is, he's always involved in some sort of way. Whether he's scoring, assisting, or missing chances, he's always involved. And hopefully we see Luis Diaz after, you know, a bit of turmoil in the last few weeks in terms of family matters, but he was scoring for his country. I expect him to be back in the starting lineup. And that front three there, it ain't Salah, um, Mane, and Firmino, but it's pretty much close to it. It's a really important trio. It's goals, it's assists. And it's chances, and that's what Liverpool have been this season, chance creation. On the other side of things, Man City have been more of a... They've still got goals in them. Let's not, you know, let's not cut the crap here a bit. They've still got goals in them, but they're more defensively orientated. Led by Rodri. Rodri, probably their player of the season so far this season. Whenever he's not there, they hurt. Whenever he is there, they play really, really well. Harlan in great form. Julian Alvarez's performance have dropped off a little bit, but we've seen performances from Doku and Grealish on the flanks have been massive as well. And then, you know, obviously in recent weeks, Phil Foden's been on that flank there. These guys have been the guys creating the chances for Haaland, setting him up. Bernardo Silva ducking into midfield in, in the Rodri absent, um, in the De Bruyne absence as well. So there's a lot of different ways Man City can figure themselves. I can never really work out how they're setting up in a game. But this season was supposed to be built in defence with Diaz, with Vardiol, with Stones at the back. Um, it's been makeshift at times, been injuries at times, but the identity is off the back of that defensive play. That's why it'll be interesting to see how these two teams sort of match up because Liverpool, I think, will be more on the front foot in this game despite City being at home. We know how hard they are to beat the Eddie had. They're such a skillful team at home, but I think Liverpool got there trying to be the more progressive, trying to be more the, the, the chance creating side, and that could lead us to a really open game of football. So. I hope Liverpool score first. I think we'll be doing the watch song here as well for it. So hopefully it's an exciting game. But if Liverpool score first, you'd expect City to come out of their shell a bit and try and attack. And that will give us one of those classic Liverpool Man City games. Um, are we a battle of the wingers? You know, Foden and Doku versus Diaz and Salah. There'll be a midfield battle there as well with Gravenberch, Endo, 
maybe even McAllister um, in that in a three there, or do they go and put Gakpo? If I don't know how it's going to match it up, but then you got Rodri, Bernardo Silva, Julian Alvarez as a ten. There's so many different configurations these two teams have. They've got so much quality. So all these battles, the midfield battle, the wingers battle, it's going to be a great watch. I hope there's goals in it. I'm predicting a two-two draw. I think Liverpool take it to City. I think Liverpool right now, if they come out of this result with a two-two draw, people will be talking about them being real title contenders. Our next game on Saturday is in Lancashire. It's Burnley hosting West Ham. And two teams have had polar opposite seasons. Burnley, we expect them to come up and play that style of football, which they're playing currently. But the results just haven't followed. And we keep talking about on the, on the um, podcast here, when is it time that they have to get rid of Vincent Kompany? Or when does Vincent Kompany have to swallow his pride and play a bit more defensive, counter-attacking style of football? You see West Ham do it week after week, and it's working for them. They've played... Um, the absolute <laughs> classic counter-attacking football. David Moyes' men have done it so far this season. They've done it against Newcastle, against Chelsea, against Brighton, and gotten results in these games. And they'll probably do the same thing here against Burnley, who at home will continue to play that ball-playing style. You know, that, um, West Ham will press up. They'll nick the ball back in high areas. And then when you've got Bowen in the form, he's in. Ward Prowse and Suchek for midfield facilitating. Lucas Pakatar in great form as well. You know, it just leads to wins for West Ham. They won a classic 3-2 last time out versus Forest, and it was because their counter-attacking style was better than the other counter-attacking style there from Forest. I think so far this season, they've exceeded everyone's expectations. Last season, the form wasn't really there, but I guess we can say it was because they're focused on Europe. But so far this season, they've been very, very impressive. Amongst that top half, um, they locked in their style of football and the signings they made for the Declan Rice money I think has changed their season. Suchek, Ward Prowse, Alvarez um, and even in recent weeks Mohamed Kudus up front as well. These guys are the guys that are giving them goals, giving them chance creation and important in this counter-attacking style because in some games, maybe like this Burnley game, they might not get many chances but if they can pounce on the counter or pounce on mistakes that's where they're winning games of football. For Burnley, you know, it was a tough time out last time out. 3-1 loss to Arsenal. They looked all right in the first half, but once Arsenal will flip that switch in the second half, they were long gone. I think once again, they have to play a bit of counter-attack, get Kolyosha on the counter, get Lyle Foster in behind on a, on a sort of fast break, if you know what I mean, or downhill. Um, because when they're playing in possession, it's not enough space for these pacey guys to exploit. Their midfield isn't good enough to stack up against West Ham, let alone any other Premier League teams in terms of playing in possession. And mistakes have cost them. So... I think it's time they change their change this other play. I, I expect a Bowen masterclass in this game. I think West Ham will come away with a, a 3-1 win at Burnley. I think counter-attacking style of football will suit them to a T, and I can't imagine Vincent Company going away from his possession style of football. So I think Burnley once again pick up another loss and pressure continues to build in Vincent Company. Alright, our next game's an interesting one. It's Luton hosting Crystal Palace. And we've seen Luton the last few games find a groove a little bit. You know, it's not impressive style of football, but it's a style of football that might work. They've conceded two goals against Manchester United and Liverpool combined in their last two games. Could have got a point at Old Trafford. Got a point at home versus Liverpool. So, you know, there's positives there. It's good signs. They come up against a Crystal Palace side, however, who may be a gettable. We know they're being, you know, better performing at home. They're at home here. Crystal Palace aren't much of an attacking side especially to start games off. They're really slow to start games off out the block. So I think there's an opportunity here for Luton behind some of these new quality players they've picked up, like Barkley, like Townsend, to, you know, make it hard make it hard, make it hard for uh, Crystal Palace. Um, make it a struggle. Make them have to really force themselves to, you know, um, spread themselves, get forward, throw numbers forward, and then counter-attack them. That, to hit strong goal against Newcastle, um, against Liverpool, where it's the perfect example of counter-attacking football that Luton can play. They're finding some form. They're finding their feet in the Premier, it looks like. And in this game, I think they can get something out of it. Crystal Palace, obviously, as I said, have struggled across the last you know, five, six, seven weeks in terms of their attacking output. They get Eze back, though. He's a big part of it. He was massive in their last time out performance against Everton. They lost 3-2, but the attacking style of play was there. Edward's in the goals again. Him and Eze's link up be very, very important. I wouldn't be surprised if Mateta and Edward both lead the line to you know get more attacking output against a low block that Luton will play. I think it'll be a tough game to call because of, we don't know which you know Crystal Palace team will come out there, and we don't know how Luton will go. They've been so resilient defensively in recent weeks, but is that damn out to break? I think it's a really hard game to call. I'm going with a one-all draw. I think Luton will get something in this game. They'll get a go early, and Crystal Palace will bide one back, but. Definitely a game to keep your eye out from because it could be a bit of an upset here.
Next game is up on Tyneside. It is Newcastle hosting Chelsea. And this game has sort of been ruled by injuries. Obviously, Newcastle ravaged by a lot of injuries, um, which has hurt them. They were last time out beaten 2-0 convincingly by Bournemouth. They're looking to bounce back um, against a Chelsea side who have had an absolute roller coaster last, four, uh, last two weeks. They scored four goals in the last two games versus City and Tottenham, coinciding with four points in those games. We've seen a turnaround here with Pochettino's side. Um, obviously, the goals are there to be seen, but it's not just the goals. The way they're playing, a um, bit more of a link up now between midfield and the forwards. We've, it also coincides with Reese James' return. He's been in great form. Thiago Silva's playing like a 23-year-old. Raheem Sterling's been remarkable so far this season for Chelsea as well. And Nick Jackson getting in the goals some Cole Palmer penalties as well. All of this sort of has culminated in some big results and you know big performances. Like their last time performance versus Man City was ultra impressive. They took it to City. They were arguably the better side than seeing this game. Um, and you know, got a 1-1, a 4-4 draw and one point, but probably deserved all three in, in many regards. They were the better team playing some more expansive football and really threatening uh, Man City. The chance creation is there now for Chelsea in the weeks prior I've been talking about how I was worried that they weren't creating enough chances for the possession they were having but what we're seeing in the recent few weeks is chances are coming which is a good sign um, Enzo's in there Kaiseido's in there now you're adding Kunku to this you know to this mix in a few weeks time they look very very dangerous um, Mikhailo Mudrik again not the output but really the performances are coming across nicely as well so it's all sort of coming together for Chelsea and obviously it's a massive game a tough game going up there to Newcastle those fans are absolutely ravenous um, they've still got world-class players and quality players in there like Pope, like Trippier, Fabian Cher, Longstaff, Almiron, Gordon. All these guys are still quality players. They're missing some of their heartbeats, but they're nothing to be, you know, down-talked about. I know they had a bad game last time out. I just don't think they were up for it. They were a bit flat-footed, not at the races, but they'll be up for this game. A big game. Another one we're treated to in this weekend. I think it'll be a tougher Chelsea. I think they can get the job done going up there. I think they're togetherness and the fact they've got more players fit will help them but also the form and the momentum they currently have to carry on here i think they nick a 2-1 win up there in newcastle as i said though it's gonna be a very tough game newcastle away is one of the toughest games in the premier league or let, let alone the world at the moment so they're gonna have their work cut out for them i think mauricio pochettino gets his team together i think this is a turning point for their season now if chelsea win this they go and kick on they try and push for champions league europa league style of football so a big game for them i think they get the job done 2-1 Our next game takes us to the city ground. It is Nottingham Forest hosting Brighton and Hove Albion. Another tale of two sides on different trajectories right now. Forest have been quite impressive in the last few weeks, playing a very exciting football um, on the counter attack, exploiting teams. It's taken some time, but finally this team looks like a unit. They're together. I've got to tell you what, I've got to shout out this front two of Tayo Wanyi and Antti Alanga. We've seen them together now, um, fit together for the first time, it feels like, um, last weekend. And boy, they're exciting to watch versus West Ham. I think, you know, road call, but outside the top eight clubs, probably the most exciting front two in the Prem, the way they link up, um, you know, how good they are on the counter, how quick and strong they can be. And they, those two just screen goals this season. They might not have the sheer number on paper, but they're always a threat and always a danger on the counter. We saw a few weeks back against Aston Villa that Nottingham Forest absolutely exploited them on the counter attack. I think they'll do a similar thing this time around to Brighton. That midfield's coming together nicely. Dominguez, Mangala, um, Toflu seems to have made himself a cop here in recent wings off the flank there. They've got a solid back line. And you know what it is? It's Steve Cooper. I really rate him as a manager. He gets results done, right? He He's able to find results when they probably don't seem possible. He's a point winner and he gets stuff done. I think in this game here, going against a Brighton team that need a result, right? They haven't won since... Um, let's have a look here. They haven't won since Estupinian got injured in match week six. So it's been a long, long time. Some important draws in there but also some really disappointing draws and some disappointing losses they need to bounce back they've been good in europe but i think the cause of the problem is too much going on there's too many rotations in the lineup there's been a few injuries but there's never continuity built in this side the strikers constantly changing you know the midfields are often changing the keeper the fullbacks are constantly changing and outside of basically matoma gross and dunk i feel like every position is constantly having a revamp um and it's timing to serve just sticks with an 11 for the Premier League to get some continuity, to get some results. Because if it wasn't for some big results at the start of the season, they could be looking at a bottom half position right now. They're just hanging on to that um, eighth or ninth spot in the Premier League. But another poor result this weekend, they could be looking at you know a bottom half for the first time this season. And that's the where Brighton want to be. And that's the where they want to be going in the future. 
a few shining lights. Obviously, Matoma's been incredible, but Adringa so far this season's looked like that new winger to replace, um, to you know, be worth a lot of millions of dollars in the years to come. But he's been really good to start the season off. I've liked his form. I want to see him, Ferguson, and Matoma up front. Let's really see the best of Brighton in the Premier League rather than just makeshift lineups. I know they're going all right in Europe, but let's still focus on the Premier League because at the end of the day, that's how you get into Europe. It's through Premier League form. We've got a chance against the Forest side, but obviously Forest are very, very difficult to beat at home. Forest in good form as well. I think it'll be a tough game. Two contrasting styles. Brian in possession, Forest on the counter-attack. It's going to create for a great game. I think Forest get a result here. I think they get a 2-2 result versus Brighton. Brighton, yet again, not able to get over the line. And I think Nottingham Forest, with the, those forwards they've got and the midfield clicking, I think they get a result here. I think, yeah, 2-2 two is a fair result for this one. Our next game comes from the bottom end of the table. Sheffield United host Bournemouth. Sheffield had a great few weeks, obviously beating Wolves, taking it to Man United recently, um, and obviously getting the result away to Brighton with a draw there. So four points in the last two games. The vibes are up, the momentum's up at Sheffield, but I think it ends there. Um, they come against a Bournemouth side who have finally clicked under Andre Iriola, I believe. They've got some confidence after that 2-0 win versus Newcastle last time out. Dom Solanke's in the goals this season. Proved to be one of the best strikes in the league. Six goals in his 12 Premier League games, including that double versus Newcastle. They're constantly a threat. When Phil Billings out midfield, they look very, very solid. Um, we're seeing the best of Clive at last few games. He's playing great football. Semenyo, without an end product, has still been really, really impressive. I think we're finally seeing that possession, that more progressive, open style of football that we were promised under Andre Ariola come to fruition here um, with Bournemouth. An impressive few weeks. It's finally clicking together. I think they'll take it to Sheffield United here. Obviously, Sheffield will be backing on those that sort of midfield group. Hamer, Norwood, McAtee, Vinicius, Souza to win their game because that's where that comes from from Sheffield United for me. When they win that midfield battle, when they're not able to get overrun in there and able to you know, create some chances for Cameron Archer up top, that's when they look their best. Um, but in, in terms of coming up against this workman-like midfield that Bournemouth have, I don't think they can get over the line there. I think the quality of Bournemouth will be too much. I think the quality of coaching is going to be too much as well. I've got them winning 2 0 away from home, a big result for Bournemouth. And I expect them now to kick on a little bit and sort of spread away from that bottom three and into that sort of mid table bracket. Our next game takes us to Brentford. They're hosting Arsenal. I think this will be a bit of a straightforward game. I know how good Brentford have been in recent weeks. I love their home form. Um, Brian and Burma has been incredible. Matesi Jensen in the midfield has been very important for them. And that back line, Ayer, Pinnock. Um, as well as um, Collins at the back line as well. They've been very impressive in recent weeks. They've gone back to that back four and been impressive, but they come up against an Arsenal side who's arguably one of the best in the league. They just get their job done currently. Gabriel Martinelli might not have the output right now, but he's been very impressive. We know how good Saka is in the flank. I expect Eddie and Ketia to in turn up front. He loves these sort of games. He'll score a bunch of goals, I feel like, um, towards the mid and end point of the season against these sort of teams. I think their quality is too much. It's a pretty simple... Um, game for me. Obviously, Arsenal coming off their 3-1 win against Burnley last time out. Brentford, despite having good form, got turned over by Liverpool. Despite having some great chances, actually, in that game as well. I need to touch on that. They were, you know, high in chance creation, just couldn't get the goals they needed. A 3-0 loss there. But in this game here, Arsenal, they'll cruise it, I think. 3-0 win for them. They're just on this, you know, sort of roll right now. Where they're just getting results. They're not playing incredible. They're not playing poor. They just keep you know, knocking off results, keep ticking off results. And want to stay in touch with Man City and in Liverpool in this three-way title race. Next game is another big one for the top four. It is Tottenham hosting Aston Villa. Who would have thought these two be given either top four positions? But um, again, another two teams who have had contrasting sort of forms in recent weeks. We know what's happened to Spurs. Absolutely demolished by injuries, by suspensions. They've got Eric Dyer and... Ben Davies playing at the back. So we saw against Wolves a total change in the style of football and philosophy that Ange went with. They defended basically from that first goal and it hurt them in the end. They ended up losing that game 2-1 in stoppage time there. Um, Wolves getting the better of them there. But they're just seen to be not that same team. You lose Madison, you lose the two centre-backs and you lose that identity, that expressive style of football that Spurs were playing on the front foot, getting at teams, dominating in midfield. It also fell apart. So... They come against Aston Villa side, they probably will dominate them in midfield. They've got one of the most four midfields in the league right now. McGinn, 
Douglas Louise, Kamara, Zaniola when he goes in there as well. There's names, Yuri Tillemans. One of their, probably their strongest points is their midfield. Then they've got one of the most informed strikes in, in the league right now, Nolly Watkins. And you've got Diaby joined by Leon Bailey on the flanks. There's just so much creativity in this Aston Villa side. And Unai Amri is getting the best out of all these sort of players here. Their fullbacks bomb on, create chances. And right now the defence is solid as a rock behind... Um, a shaky Amy Martinez a few weeks ago, but normally a very solid Amy Martinez. So it's two teams in crunch and contrasting forms. I'd love to see them both at their peak because we'd be seeing some of those open-ended, aggressive, attacking style of football. But as such, I think Spurs, despite being at home, will revert to being that defensive style again. They just got to get through this month, get out of this November, December period and get all their players back. At least they doggy will be back in this game. They still have that midfield pivot in Basuma and Papsar. Human Son is still there, but you're still without Madison, without Van der Ven, without Romero. And that really hurts your team. It really, it changes the identity because those two centre-backs, you know, were able to play so high that they had to play so aggressive in possession because they could make up on the counter-attack and come in and pick up players. Their pace and their power was so easy to come back and get teams on transition. But because they're two of slower centre-backs in Davies and in Dyer, they have to play with a deeper line. I see it at Manchester United when Maguire and Lindelof play. You can't be as progressive. You can't be as unfront-footed and on the halfway line like you are normally with those two good centre-backs. So it changes the whole philosophy. And without Madison, you lose that number 10. You lose that chance creator, which Spurs have been craving for since Eric Ericsson left. And they lose him once again. The chances are not as good. They're not as greatly created. Hoiberg in that midfield alongside those two, they're not much chance creators. It's going to come off counter attacking style of football, getting in behind Kulaseski, maybe ducking into midfield and creating something. Because Son, you know, he's a guy that runs in behind and can pick the ball up on a counter attack, but he's not much of a guy that creates a shot for himself. So it's two different style of football. I'm interested to see how the midfield battle goes. As I said, a more defensive, robust group now in Spurs versus a really chance creation, all rounded, you know, back and forth, high energy midfield of Aston Villa. That probably is where the game lies. That's where the key of the game lies, especially if Spurs sit back. Whoever wins that midfield battle will probably go on to win the game. I think Villa in the form they are with Uno Emery at the wheel and absolutely dominating right now, Villa. I've got them winning this game three goals to one. I think they'll go to Spurs and dominate them off the park. I think Oli Watkins being the goal, Diaby might get, be in the goals, and John McGinn always in the goals. I expect him to be on the score sheet as well. Then that brings us to our penultimate game of the week. Candidates Everton hosting Manchester United. And that's all the news been um, during the international breaks. all been about Everton. The 10-point reduction after they've been found um, to exceeding the Premier League's financial fair play regulations. They're now sitting rock bottom. Equal with Burnley on four points. But they'll be looking to bounce back. And they've played some great football in recent weeks. Obviously, that 3-2 win last time out versus Palace away from home just shows the form they're in. And behind the likes of Calvert-Lewin, Decore, Jack Harrison and even James Garner, they're just creating chance on these counter-attacks. They're not playing in possession, they're playing that Sean Dice system, but they're scoring, they're being ruthless when they get the opportunity. And I think against a Manchester United team that's really out of form, poor performances, but results are going their way, it's a chance to get at them. You know, Manchester United have never really been good going at Everton, they've really struggled away from home there. This is a chance for them to really show up. You know, Everton can really counter-attack United, get at them. United will push numbers forward, get at them early, get a goal early, and if you get that first goal, I think that sums up this game. Whoever gets this first goal will go on and win the game of football. And I think Everton do do that. I think they might go on and win this game. I think United, despite all the good news in the week of players returning the train, they're not going to be there. It's still that same injured squad. There's still the problems with Varane, problems with Casemiro. It's a really different side of what we saw last season. It's not the same sort of aura and mentality they have last season. Ten Hag's done a great job in getting results, but performances haven't come. And I think in this game, you want a good performance, especially at... Uh, at Goodison Park. This crowd will be up for it. They want the points. They want to get back to where they belong. Everton are probably in, in the greater form of the two sides, which says a lot about where the both teams are at at the current point in time. So um, United obviously win 1-0 versus Luton, but didn't play convincingly at all. Out of form, Rashford. Out of form, Anthony. Bruno Fernandes trying everything he can, but he can't pull this whole team with him. Whereas Everton have got everyone pulling in the same direction. Branthwaite being very incredible in the back there. Mikalenko's in the goal his last two times out. It's just there's goals coming from DCL. It's just a really contrasting team. I think Everton get the win at home. Got them winning the game two goals to one. I think they score early and they hold on in this game. It's going to be a tight one. Both teams desperately needing a win. And that's our final game. It is Fulham hosting Wolves. A uh, bit of a mid-table classic this one, maybe. 
um, saying that Fulham are towards the near the bottom. You know, they've struggled this season. Chance creation has not been there. These are teams that start the season. I compare them. Two teams that struggled to create chances, whereas Wolves have fixed that problem under Gary O'Neill and got results. Fulham are yet to find that answer. Um, haven't had much luck in front of goal. They don't create many chances. It's all in the back of Willian. Andreas Pereira has been out of form since he's come back from his injury. He's not the same player. So it's on Willian to create all the chances. Rahim has at least gotten the goals last time out for Sevilla in that 3-1 loss, but um, it's still really, really hard to see them scoring more than one goal in a game of football. That midfield is heavily reliant on Palina, and the back is heavily reliant on Tim Ream to control the game. He's been a lot of pressure, and he's done very well this season. Him alongside Bassi, you'd think it'd be a good partnership, but they've been exposed too many times this season. A lot of mistakes at the backs, you know, not helped them. Uh, Bert Leno's tried his best throughout the season as well to be a, a solid rocket there, but right now Fulham are just a shadow themselves last season, and I can't see anything coming out of this game. Despite being a home, I think Wolves are one of the most informed teams in the comp. Gary O'Neill, it's, it's not like expressive style of football, but it's still progressive. It's on the counter attack, but still chance creation. It's quite a funny system. It's hard to see on the eye what it actually is, but they play so well. It's behind Huang, it's behind Lamine in that midfield, and even Pablo Sarabi in the last game, that Spurs 2-1 win. It's ridiculous that he just gets players to play so well for him. The defense has held up so well with Doherty, um, Ait Nuri, um, Kilman. It always seems someone's doing a job at the back for them. Um, they get results when they need to. I think this is the prime occasion here. They might not play um, really exciting brand, brand of football against Fulham, especially if they're going away, but I think they'll get the result. I think a 2-1 win for them here, they'll just have the better quality in the final third. They'll be the better team, and as such, I think I can see them winning this game 2-1. So, ladies and gents, that brings this prediction video to an end for Match Break 13. How good is that the Premier League bag? I'm super pumped this weekend. Some classics this weekend. Let's just go through them. You've obviously got Everton looking to bounce back after, after their loss of points versus Man United. You've got Spurs, Aston Villa. Um, also blended in there, Nottingham Forest and Brighton. Two teams are in different contrasting forms. Obviously, Newcastle and Chelsea. Um, and then you've also got Man City Liverpool. So, there's games galore that are going to be interesting. A lot to keep your eye upon. Obviously, we'll be doing the live watch along for Liverpool and Man City early kickoff midday on Saturday. Keep an eye out for that. Um, with that all being said, guys, hope you enjoy the weekend's action. And let me know what you think of my picks in the comments down below. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, all those good things. We're trying to grow the channel over this Christmas period, so any support would be much appreciated. That all being said, guys, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend, and I'll see you for another video very, very soon. See you later.